Yeah, I look at coach as such a bigger thing than just being a person that helps athletes get better at sports. Back control of your life, of your mindset, so that you aren't dependent on anyone or anything to be mentally healthy. Feeling the pressure, feeling the expectations, school, sports, all this stuff. There was a way to navigate it and achieve high levels of success and still be mentally healthy along the way, right? Humility is not thinking less of yourself. It's just thinking of yourself less. And so I'm successful and I'm a winning athlete because I've stuck to who I really am and what I value. Andrew, are you just like some like participation trophy type coach where it's like everybody's a winner? Not, not really. I just want people to have winning within their control. Are you sure you didn't pursue it because it's not your definition of winning or because you were scared and you let fear hold you back? It's not just about being an optimistic, positive thinker. It's about getting yourself into the state, the emotional and mental state where you feel confident, courageous, bold, like you could do anything. And if an athlete's in that state, which requires positive reflection, they literally can do anything. There is something that you've been put on this earth to do to be great at, that you will love doing, and that you will help other people doing, and it is probably not your sport. Welcome back, Wellness Ninjas, to another episode of the Wellness Dojo podcast. I'm your host, Kyle Craig, and excited about today's topic. For me, this is a conversation that is really a personal one for me. It touches close to my heartstrings as a parent, as a coach. Um, but before we get into that, I want to introduce today's special guest. He's an athletic performance coach who's passionate about developing the healthy athlete, both inside and out. His new book, Hey Athlete, I'm Talking to You really focuses on developing that mindset of the athlete that translates into real life. Really cool stuff. Welcome to the show, Mr. Andrew Simpson. Well, thank you so much, brother. And I think it's awesome that you call your uh, listeners ninjas. Wellness ninjas, is that it? Wellness ninjas, yeah. Oh, I love it. I'm going to start using that. (laughs) Yeah, man, that's uh, kind of my world of growing up in martial arts as as a student who's being coached and really taking... You know, my whole business is kind of around this concept of like what sport did for me and how I can give that back to other people. So a really cool conversation for us to come together and have today, because I know that's something that you're so passionate about as well. Yeah, man, I'm excited. I really am. Yeah. So, Andrew, can you first just kind of I'm really curious anytime I talk with another coach, I'm really curious about like kind of what got you into coaching before we dive in too much into the book which I want to get a lot of juicy details from you with. Um, what kind of made you want to become a coach and, and help athletes? Yeah, I mean, it's I kind of accidentally stumbled upon coaching, but I, I would say to summarize what got me into it was coming across a guy that was changing people's lives, and in particular changing student-athletes' lives by not just taking them through sets and reps as a personal trainer, which is what he was at the end of the day, uh, but – really investing in their lives and and being a part of their lives. I mean, I watched these kids that he was training. I I shadowed this guy for a long time before I kind of went full force into the whole athletic performance industry. And I mean, these kids would invite him to their graduation parties and their graduations and their signing days and like these big events in their lives. And they invited him because he was more than just a coach. He was, he was their friend. He was their coach. He was their therapist at times. And so yeah, I look at coach as such a bigger thing than just being a person that helps athletes get better at sports. Um, a coach can really change lives. And so that's what got me into it was another person doing that. I was like, wow, I want that, right? I want to help people. Yeah, that's so cool. And like, it seems to resonate like across the board whenever I speak to other coaches and and with myself as well. It's kind of like that same thing of, you know, my martial arts instructor growing up was that for me as well is like, it wasn't just somebody who got you to the end goal. It was somebody who developed you. And then that end goal just kind of became like a, a milestone along the way to developing the person. Right. Yeah. And I think it has to be, if you're going to coach long-term because coaching can be a thankless job at the end of the day. And it can be a, you're putting in way more hours, you're overworked and underpaid for sure as a coach. Um, And if you forget why you're doing it, then yeah, that's going to be very easy to burn out quickly. Yeah. Yeah. 
Yeah, that's that's a really interesting topic that I want to come back to later about that, that perspective with the coaching. But I do want to talk a little bit about the book as well. Hey, athlete, I'm talking to you. I know you've you've written another book before also, but why this book? Like, why why write this book at this time? And maybe you can also talk a little bit just to the audience who might not know about the book yet, a little bit about what it is all about. Yeah, so you mentioned my first book, The Youth Truth, and that was written to coaches and parents. And I didn't really foresee a need at the time to write a book to the athlete themselves because I don't think kids read books nowadays. But uh, so this is last year where the mental health kind of epidemic, we can call it, started to spike even higher than ever before, where all of these college athletes were taking their own lives. And more than ever before, we saw in 2022, this was happening. And we had an organization come to us, which PFP, Players Fitness and Performance, we are from the outside looking in, we're a gym. So why would a mental health organization come to us and say, hey, what are you guys going to do about this? How are you guys going to respond to this? Because they knew that we were involved in the, the mental health space for athletes. And so we ended up holding this big event at our gym called Take Back Control. And this message was just on my heart where, you know, what if your coach doesn't change athlete? What if your parents never recognize that they're putting this pressure on you? What if society never changes, which it probably won't, right? And just continues to tell you that the only way you're worthy is if you get a scholarship and, and achieve the highest levels in sports. Like what if none of that changes? Is there still a way for you to be mentally strong and healthy? And we called it taking back control, right? Taking back control of your life, of your mindset, so that you aren't dependent on anyone or anything to be mentally healthy. And we had enough, we had worked with enough college athletes and high school athletes to know that there was a way to uh, to navigate this world of feeling the pressure, feeling the expectations, school, sports, all this stuff. There was a way to navigate it and achieve high levels of success and still be mentally healthy along the way. We had seen some athletes do it. And so we started to really look at like, what do they do differently and how do they think differently? And it was completely different than the way the other kids who were either depressed, suicidal, completely differently than the way they were viewing life and circumstances and what coach was saying to them and all these different things that we can talk about today. So we held this event called Take Back Control. Over 200 student athletes flocked into the gym, coaches, parents as well. And we basically delivered this message through about six to eight different speakers that was all consistent with here's how you take back control here's how you take back control of your thoughts your emotions your actions your reactions and it was awesome and it was a huge breakthrough for a lot of these kids they felt relieved and then i felt like we were good to go right like we did it and then i felt this little whisper that was like you got to put this in a book now so that more kids can 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 read this and, and learn these things and so I went away to a cabin man for two days and I literally cranked out about 80% of this. It's a pretty short read. It's about 120 pages, I think, but I cranked out about 80% of it in two days. I just buy a computer for, you know, 10 hours a day, just wrote this book. And then uh, I had about five or six other college athletes write their stories and contribute to the book, which made it way better. I mean, I, I always tell people like, this book was like 20% me and then 80% of it was the depth of these stories that these, these college student athletes tell. And so, yeah, man, it, la it launched a few months ago and it's been helping a lot of kids. A lot of, a lot of sports teams are getting it for all of their athletes because they see a need um, to help their kids mentally just as much as physically. Yeah. That's so awesome. And what a, what a empowering event to be able to, to put together and, and to be able to just provide for people. Right. That's right. That's right. And, you know, something that really resonates when you're talking there is, you kind of mentioned the the coaching profession and how it can be kind of it's a draining profession, right? It can be so empowering, but at the same time, when you're hearing stories like that too, or when you're looking back at like there's a lot of like maybe I could have done this better or maybe I could have helped this person more. I imagine that there's some real heartbreak in you know exploring that avenue as well. Yeah, yeah, you, you definitely can't can't get that, uh, what is it, the, the savior complex, right? Where you think that you are the ultimate savior and that you can help everybody and save everybody. Yeah, I think uh, that's something that in my first probably five, four to five years of being a coach, I did not understand that concept. And I put the weight of the world on my shoulders a lot of the times. And it, you could tell, right? Your family can tell, your kids can tell, your wife can tell, 
Um, and so, yeah, that's something that I had to learn the hard way to really let go of that and just do the best that I could every single day and then have boundaries. Yeah. 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 When you were starting to kind of hear some of these stories and starting to kind of put some of the pieces together that there was a real issue here with how athletes were maybe moving on from the sport or developing from sport to life and that there was a disconnect here. And you mentioned seeing a big difference between like athletes that were kind of moving on and being successful with life and athletes that were really struggling mentally what were some of the biggest differences that you were seeing with in those athletes that were struggling? Yeah, sure. I mean, there, I, I've got a few of those off the top of my head. One is the way that they viewed mistakes and how they responded to adversity or failure or falling short. Uh, mm -hmm. The kids who, the kids who ended up being mentally healthy and, and strong uh, when, when they made a mistake, when they, when they fell short, when they didn't get the scholarship, when they didn't get first team all conference, when coach did bench them, they were thinking of it as, this is an opportunity. This is a gift. This is, I'm going to grow from this somehow. Um, whereas the other kids, they viewed it as I'm a failure, right? If I failed, I'm a failure. And so they internalized it. They took on that identity of failure. And when we trace it back to the way they grew up and, and how they viewed, how they watched their parents respond to mistakes and uh, it made sense, right? And so for a lot of these kids, uh, the ones that were handling it well, they had probably seen it modeled growing up. But the ones who didn't, we knew that there was a way to teach them, right? There was a way to teach them and, and help them to make this mindset shift from, for, ex for this example, you know, is it a mistake or is a breakdown needed for a breakthrough sometimes, right? Like, how are you mm -hmm. viewing this? And so the way they viewed adversity and mistakes was very different. Also, the ones who were mentally healthy, they had this, uh, they didn't call it this, but it was very clear that they viewed sports as an infinite game not a finite game. And this comes from a, a topic that uh, author Simon Sinek writes about where when you view sports as an infinite game, the point of playing is to do a few things. It's to keep the game going as long as it can, to enjoy it along the way, to get as good as you possibly can and keep progressing along the way. And there's no clear winner or loser. There's no starting point and ending point in the infinite game. Again, the whole point is to perpetuate the game and keep it going. And these are the kids that you see once they're finished with college sports, they get into coaching eventually and they continue to play the sport in rec leagues and they continue to love it because they never viewed it as this like finite, got to get it now. My career's coming to an end. This is my last season playing. Like they didn't have that tight grip on it that caused anxiety. And then when you look at the flip side, the athletes that view sports as a finite game, I mean, they're always against the clock. It feels like time is always ticking for them. They feel like they got to get it all in now. And they just operate with this sense of tension. And you know that as an athlete, tension is the worst thing you can have, right? If you're playing free and loose and you're not worried about the short-term failures along the way, then you're just going to perform a lot better. So those are a couple of the, the differences. And there's, I guess, in total, there's seven of them, right? I talk about these seven mindset hacks in the book, but those are two yes. of them for sure. Yeah. Yeah. It's so powerful. And like what really resonates through with me is identity, right? I think so many athletes are, they identify from a very early age as like, I am a hockey player or I am a soccer player or, you know, they, that's their thing. I did. I was a martial artist growing up. That was my identity. Everybody knew me as the Kung Fu kid in school and stuff like that. Right. And it like really does become, that's who I am. And to what you, to point to what she said like it when that career or that journey is starting to come to an end or maybe that's the end of the road for your hockey career or whatever it might be I, I imagine people can really come into this identity crisis of like who am I and that's you know that's a really scary thing for athletes yeah yeah and I think a really powerful thing that we could all take our athletes through is just a simple I am exercise and not from a standpoint of like trying to pump yourself up. That's good. Like those affirmations and whatnot, like I am strong, I am confident, but really like personalizing it. Like, who am I? Uh, mm -hmm. I am a hard worker. I am a dependable person. I am a leader. I am a brother. I am a son. I am a, I mean, all these things that are true for who you are. When you look at that list and you see like, it's not, it doesn't have anything to do with my position or my vocation. This is who I am. And you could take away sports and I still am these things. 
Yeah. And so when a kid, when a kid has a firm understanding of who they really are, um, this is an example. I share a story of this girl named Carly who went to Michigan University to play lacrosse. She committed when I think she was a freshman in high school. So her whole life she had spent preparing for this moment to play college lacrosse at a D1 level. Yet when she got there as a freshman, this condition that was going on in her legs just got worse and worse. And long story short, it ended up being popliteal entrapment syndrome, which is where blood flow can't travel from the upper leg to the lower leg, causing complete numbness in your legs. Well, you can't play lacrosse when your legs are completely numb. So this girl never saw the field and she tried to get surgeries and push through it for two years, freshman and sophomore year, never saw the field. And the only thing that kept her from going down a really bad path with her mental health was that she could look back and say, I am hardworking. I am all these things that I am. I've just been using them to fuel my lacrosse career for all these years, not the other way around, not I am a lacrosse player. And that's the only thing I have in my life. It's like, no, I can take all these things and now I can apply them to something different. And so she did. She became a coach with the other coaches and ended up going through all four years as a, as a coach along the sidelines. And she turned something that looked to be terrible into actually a gift that helped her realize, like, I'm a great coach, too, because, again, it's not about lacrosse. Yeah. Yeah. And I love the idea of using sport as a tool. Right. It's like it's not like sport is the thing, but sport is rather a tool that we use to discover ourselves a little bit more right. and discover like what we're capable of. Right. It sounds Absolutely. a little bit of like what, what she went through as well. So, yep. hundred percent. And she needed someone along the way though, to remind her of that. And I think that's yeah. where we as coach, even, even when you're the coach of the sport, if you can keep that perspective that your sport is not the end all be all, and that it's really just a vehicle to help kids develop, um, then it, it really doesn't matter what they go through in life. You can always reframe it to something positive like we're talking about. Yeah. When we think about those I am's, uh, one that comes to my mind that I think is really powerful is there's a lot of athletes out there who are identify as being a winner. Like I am a winner. Like I am here to win. And that's my only goal. And I think that can be both very powerful as an athlete like to have that confidence and to like approach like that confidence of like, no, I'm here to win. I don't settle for anything less, but I also imagine, and I've seen that that can also <clears throat> get into danger territory with that mindset. So can, can you talk a little bit about like, where's the line with that in terms of that, that winner's mindset? Yeah, this is actually perfect because uh, every month we have this program called the winning athlete inner circle. And I go on and I teach all of the athletes that are part of this program via a Zoom call. The very first thing I say in those uh, coaching mindset sessions, uh, the second slide is what is a winning athlete? Because our program is called the winning athlete formula and the mm -hmm. program is the winning athlete inner circle. And so I define it right off the bat so that they don't get confused. And it's four things. A winning athlete is one who knows that life is about what he or she can give, not get. Therefore, our experiences, if we fail, they become our gifts for others. That's the very first thing that a winning athlete is. The second thing is a winning athlete is courageous. The winning athlete leans in and is open and honest with themselves and with others. They don't shy away from fear. They lean into it. The third thing is they participate. They raise their hand. They get out of their comfort zone. They go first, which is kind of the definition of a leader at the end of the day. And then the last one is they define success, not as everybody else defines it. They don't just adopt somebody else's definition of success. They view success based on what they truly value. So the young man or woman who is, let's call it a, a person of faith, uh, that is a Christian, like that person, success for them is staying true to who they are, even if they're around other young men or women that aren't Christians that are bashing their faith. You know, success for another person you know, might be, hey, you know what? I love my family a lot. And like, I grew up where our, our family was tight knit and all of my friends are telling me that I should, you know, just like be gone all the time and never spend any time with my family and always be with my friends. But you know what? I'm successful and I'm a winning athlete because I've stuck to who I really am and what I value. And yeah, so I hang out with my my family on a Friday night some, sometimes, like it's staying true to who you are. So I, I don't know, when you, when you ask that question, uh, I think that you have to define what winning is for you at the end of the day, 
Uh, and that's how you can stay a winner no matter what happens on that scoreboard. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's a difficult thing for an athlete to navigate alone because we all know what winning looks like from the outside. It's that first place trophy. It's that gold medal. It's that, um, you know, standing above everybody else. But yeah. to what you're saying, like, that's not what winning is. Winning is a very personal thing. It's a very, it's it's something that's tied to your core values, right? You'll you'll know if you are a winner if you feel like one. Because there's people that stand up on top of that podium and they've got that first place medal around their neck and they mm -hmm. do not feel like a winner. Yeah. Right? Or that person that makes all that money and then you ask them, do you feel like a winner? No, I don't feel like a winner at all. So I think that's how you know if you've got the definition right. And that's one thing that martial arts really taught me was you know, there was times when I won first place where I was like, I knew I did not deserve it. It's like the judges gave it to me, but I was like, that was not my best performance kind of thing. Yeah. And it sucks to stand up there like that. But then I've also had times where I came in second or third and I was like, man, that was the best I could give today. And it's awesome. like that feeling of accomplishment is like, yeah, I worked hard for that third place medal. And uh, that feels like winning so much more than that first place medal when you know maybe you didn't feel like you earned it as much or whatever it didn't it didn't kind of connect right yep that's so good man hey second and third still pretty good though <laughs> second and third still pretty good yeah <laughs> I've always i've always been that uh you know if you're not first you're your last kind of thing when i like growing up and like developing that um and it, it takes work it takes work to you know you got to deal with those losses you got to take some some losses on the chin and you, you got to I think that's how you got to figure out to get through that too. Right. And having coaches and parents that are around you and a support system that's around you to, you know, be that, Hey, don't worry about it. Right. What did you learn? what did you learn from that loss? Like for me, that's such a big thing is what did you learn from that loss? How do we get better from here? Because now that loss is, is an asset to you. Right. Yep. Yeah. And kids, I mean, kids will be kids. Right. So at the end of the day, they still need to be called out every once in a while. Right. Cause you know, like, you create this definition of winning and it has nothing to do with the scoreboard, but then a kid could start to settle because of fear. Right. Mm -hmm. And you know it, right. If, they, if they're like, well, you know what? I, I didn't pursue that because that's not my definition of winning. Are you sure you didn't pursue it? Cause it's not your definition of winning or because you were scared and you let fear hold you back. So they still need to be called out from time to time. Right. We all do at the end of the day. Uh, Cause I yeah. have some parents that will fight me back on this and be like, Andrew, are you just like some, like, you know, participation trophy type coach where it's like everybody's a winner it's like no not not really i just want people to have winning within their control and, and yeah. truly to define their deepest levels of success with things that they can actually influence yeah yeah and i i, I keep going back to to martial arts but I, I have an example that that i think will resonate well with you is you know i have this young young girl who's when, when she enters into fighting divisions she's very shy very timid um, and like really fearful of getting hurt when she goes in. And so she's yeah. not committing herself with the techniques to actually get the points. Like we do point fighting. So it's just like a light touch kind of thing, but still there's this fear that's connected to that. And at this last competition that we were at, uh, she lost really badly in, in her one fight, but then she had another fight. She got to go for third place. And like I told her, I'm like, just go in there, like be loose and have fun. I'm like, but if you can just, I was trying to coach her on like, if you can close that distance, you take the fear away, right? They won't be able to hit you if you get close enough kind of thing. And she went in and she like applied these things and you could just see this switch go off where it was the fear at this one point in the match was gone. Like she realized like I can outsmart this opponent and take this fear away. But like leading up to that, like, she was like, I don't want to fight. Maybe I'll just do, you know, different divisions from now on. Like there was this, this real reservation to continue to go forwards. But it's like when she took that step and I was so glad that she went in there and had the result that she had. And it wasn't the result of winning that fight. It was the result of like overcoming that fear within that fight. And it was just so, so powerful to see kids do that and to take the, like give themselves the chance to do that and not just, not just say like, ah, this is scary. So I'm not going to do it. Right. Right. And I, I mean, I can just tell based on you telling the story that like you celebrated that, right. Like you oh. celebrated when she overcame that. Cause it had nothing to do with like celebrating the scoreboard. It's like, and if you celebrate that enough times with enough enthusiasm as the coach or the parent, 
they will want to repeat that thing. Yeah. But when you celebrate just the scoreboard, like people can't always duplicate that. And then they feel worthless, right? Like you can't always duplicate what happened on the scoreboard, but you can always duplicate your ability to step into fear or to overcome a mental wall, you know, like you could duplicate those things. So yeah. that's good stuff. I love that story. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. And like self-worth is such a big thing too. When, you know, when you do come over a fear like that, like, yeah, it gets you confidence and that type of thing. But I think just self-worth, self-compassion, like those types of things are so important too. When we're, whether you're winning or losing, you have to be compassionate with yourself on, you know, did I deserve that win? Did I deserve better? You know, did I work hard enough for that? Like, is there a reason why I maybe didn't do as good today? Can you speak a little bit to just like the reflection of an athlete and how important that reflection period is? And maybe some of the things that we need to, as parents and coaches, help support a little bit more within that reflection period after a performance. Yeah, so I give a pretty simple but important framework, I think is like chapter five or something like that. It's take back control of how you measure progress. Hmm. And it's a ref- it's basically a, a, a exercise of reflection. And it comes from me being terrible at this, right? I'm always thinking about what's ahead. And that causes me to focus on the gap between where I am and where I want to be eventually. And most, a lot of athletes are like that. It's the society we live in where it's like, everyone tells you never be satisfied, never be satisfied, always be pushing for more. And I stopped one day and I thought about like, what does a career in sports or life where you are never satisfied look like? Mm -hmm. That sounds absolutely miserable never yeah. satisfied. And so I learned this great uh, concept called the gap and the gain from a mentor of mine. And it's basically like, if you imagine three circles, all side by side in a row, the circle in the middle is where I am today. The circle to the right is where I want to be, right? My bigger and better ideal future. And there's a gap between where you are today and where you want to be. And there's always going to be a gap because that bigger and better future it's always unattainable. It's perfection. It's that ideal future. And so when I asked, uh, I just did this last night with an athlete. I asked them the question, when you focus on the gap between where you are today as a gymnast and where you ultimately want to be, which is the Olympics, what do you feel when you focus on how far you're falling short of that right now? And this is a 13 year old girl, right? I'm I'm having to help her navigate this because the pressure of the weight of the world's on her shoulders right now. She feels all these expectations. She said, honestly, Andrew, she's like, I feel anxious. I feel overwhelmed. I feel like I'll never be able to do it. It's impossible. She's like, but I also feel a little motivated. And so I wrote all those words up on the board underneath this gap. And it's like, okay, the reason why you continue to focus on this gap and only focus on the gap is because it does make you feel motivated. But everything else you just told me, 75% of the emotions you experience when you focus on how far you fall short are negative. And so do you think they're helping you in your performance or hurting you? She said, they're absolutely hurting me. And then I drew that circle to the left, right behind that circle of where I, where I am today. And I asked her, I said, what circle does that represent? She's like, where I used to be. And then I drew the little gap between where she used to be and where she is today. And I said, okay, tell me about the five things you're most proud of in your life. And it took her, there was a lot of awkward silence. I mean, it took her probably five to 10 minutes to come up with just five simple things that she was proud of in her life. Because for her, all she ever gets asked by coaches and parents, all she ever thinks about is what's ahead, right? And how far she's falling short. And so it took her a while, but she was able to come up with five. And I saw her, I noticed she starts to sit up a little bit taller in her chair as she's talking about those five things. Her posture started to get a little better. And then I said, okay, tell me in the last three months, your last season of gymnastics, tell me about the progress that you've made as a gymnast. Again, it took her a little while, but she was able to start like, hey, you know what? I was able to overcome this fear of doing giants, right? A bar routine. Uh, I got better at my beam routine. I I actually developed the ability to do a back handspring on the beam. Uh, My dismount got better. And she started to tell me all these areas that she made progress. And again, man, she just, her facial expressions changed. She sat up taller in her chair. And I said, perfect. When you think about all those things, what do you feel? She's like, I feel accomplished. It wasn't even hard for her to start to share these things with me. I feel Mm -hmm. accomplished. I feel proud. I feel like I can reach my bigger and better future. I feel like I can achieve that because I know I've done it in the past. And she went on and on, man. And I was just like, it's happened so many times where I'm like, okay, when you focus on how far you've come, your progress, do you feel like you can achieve all your goals in the future? She said, absolutely, coach. 
And I'm like, okay, so why aren't we doing this more with our athletes? Why aren't we intentionally having them reflect, like you just said, reflect on everything they've done well, their wins, the positives, the benefits. It's not just about being an optimistic, positive thinker. It's about getting yourself into the state, the emotional and mental state where you feel confident, courageous, bold, like you could do anything. And if an athlete's in that state, which requires positive reflection, they literally can do anything. And so now I'm having these athletes that I work with do it daily, right? Some of them literally each day, they look back on the day before and they write down three things that they did well that day or three wins or three gratitudes. Weekly, seasonally, after each season, do it. Annually, after each year, do it. It's like, however often you need to do it to get into that state, do it, but don't not do it because your brain is only ever going to default to looking at how far do I fall short? What's wrong and what's missing? Our brains will default to that every day of the week if we don't take back control of how we measure progress. Man, I love that. I, I love the concept of these gaps. So you have a gap that's in front of you, which we always see, right? Because we're always looking forwards and we're always seeing that space from where we like where we are to where we want to be. But to look back and, and remind ourselves to look back at that gap is something that, you know, even as an adult, as a parent, as a, somebody who's in a relationship with another person, to look back at that and to go like, progress isn't just in front of me, progress is also behind me. And like, look at where we started, look at where we are today. Like, that is just like such a powerful thing that just never goes away in life. Well, and the, and the reason why we all struggle with this, and so many kids struggle with this is because we have a false view of what humility actually is. Mm hmm. People think when they think about their wins and when they talk about their victories, they think that that's being cocky. No, that's getting yourself into the place where you're not beating yourself up anymore and you're actually proud of yourself again, right? Yeah. Humility is not thinking less of yourself. It's just thinking of yourself less. And so, yeah, man, we, we got to get that out of our heads that we're being cocky when we focus on our wins or that we're dwelling on past victories, right? That's another thing that people get caught up on. They're like, you're never supposed to like settle with your past victories. No, but you should at least acknowledge him if you want to feel good, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. It, it, there's there's a concept. It was a business book that I read that it really shifted something in my mindset. Where it was like talking about failure and how we, you know, you have to fail to find success and that type of thing. And they kind of questioned that, like, but but do we have to constantly focus on failure and like learning mm -hmm. from our failures? Or could we not also look at like, what are the things that I've done really, really well? Like, where are the big successes in my life? And how do I double down and like repeat that in other That's areas? So good. Yeah, right? I love that. Really, really powerful. Just a big common theme here over this conversation for me is just perspective, right? And being able to offer athletes a new perspective and a different perspective through the big moments that are you know, happy and successful moments, but also through those big moments that are maybe devastating and crushing moments. But it's like, there's always another perspective that you can try to see another lens that you can look through, right? I think so. And I think where, where you shift from being a, uh, a coach who your kids are dependent on you to a coach that equips athletes is when you give them the tools to shift their own perspective versus you having to do it for them all the time. And so like, that's where, that's why I tried to accomplish in the book where it's like, here are all the different frameworks and tools and the questions you should ask yourself to be able to shift your perspective quickly. Uh, because for a lot of people, it doesn't come naturally. So you have to have different tools and strategies in place to help you with perspective shifting. But I think yeah. you're spot on. It is all about perspective. Yep. Yeah. And like one thing that I'm really passionate about with working with my athletes, but also working with even my clients that I, that I train that are adults is you know, you kind of mentioned the the goals and like what's next and like how do I achieve this and never being satisfied. I look at purpose as one of those things that when we're constantly looking at goals, goals are things that we will check off along the way, right? I want to win first place at this tournament. I want to qualify for this. I want to get this scholarship. These are all like goals along the way. How much work do you do with people? And I imagine it's a lot, but with focusing on like, what's the purpose that I'm, you know, striving for? Because in my opinion, the purpose is never something that ever gets checked off. Like it's not something where you're like, yes, I've achieved my purpose. It's just something that you're constantly chasing that, 
you're developing along. It's something that just like you are continually working towards and never achieving. Right. Yeah. I mean, with the athletes, I tend to talk about it uh, using the word legacy, which is a different mm. way of, of saying yep. the same thing. And uh, I'll ask them, you know, hey, uh, fast forward five to 10 years from now, you're walking through your high school down the halls and you see a jersey up on the wall with your name on it. Um, what do you want it to say underneath? Do you want it to say led the team in scoring and had first team all conference? Do you want it to say helped, you know, a hundred other players reach their full potential? Do you want it to say was a positive, hardworking, motivated individual? Like, what is it that you actually want to say? And when you help them with that perspective on what purpose really is, almost everybody, we're, we're not naturally, well, we are naturally selfish, but when we're thinking clearly, we start to think more about how did I use my platform, my gifts, my sport to help other people, right? Mm -hmm. It's that one another, one another mindset. And so purpose almost always for an athlete when they're thinking about when they're thinking clearly, it comes down to making an impact in the next generation. I want to help other kids along the way. I want to help other athletes be better at their sport. And so I think that's, that's, a, I mean, it's everything, right? You have to start with purpose, begin with the end in mind, and then reverse engineer what are the goals and the checkpoints along the way. And so I love that you brought that up because I really do think people, I don't think people spend enough time focused on purpose. It makes them uncomfortable. They don't know the answers right away. So they shy away from that. I mean, a lot yeah, of people don't right. like don't like it because it, it makes them uncomfortable. And it's not tangible, right? There's nothing tangible about yeah. chasing purpose. It's like I don't, I'm not getting anything from this. It's really hard to to feel that. Or it's like when you achieve a goal, you're like it's you can celebrate it, and there's there's something there that you're like, yes, I either I got this trophy or I got this this reward from it. Whereas purpose is not rewarding. Like it is absolutely legacy is rewarding and stuff, but it's, you never get to that place where you're like, I made it and I'm here. And so I think it becomes really difficult for people to, to see that there's something that they're working towards with a purpose, but yeah, those, I mean, those yeah. goals can help along the way, right? Like those, those goals yeah. can be a sign that you're still on the right path towards that purpose, I think. Yep. And not to get too much into like, today's society and social media and all that. But I mean, if you think about our kids nowadays, I mean, yeah. they're more addicted to dopamine than we've ever been in our lives as, you know, even our generation. And so sitting down and thinking about your purpose is never going to give you a dopamine hit, right? Yeah. It's not going to give you that same yeah. feeling as when you see a ding on your phone or you see somebody like the post, like yeah. it's going to produce long-term it produces oxytocin, which obviously is much deeper hormonal feeling and it's going to lead to fulfillment long-term, but it's not going to give you that quick dopamine hit. And so that's where we have to teach these kids like about how their brains work and hormone, you know, like it's, it's valuable yep. to teach them these things because otherwise they're going to always think that, you know, that quick dopamine hit that they get from their social media is the most fulfilling thing they'll ever get. It's like, no, 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 no. You're not even getting close. Let's talk yep. about purpose. <laughs> yeah, man. What are the age groups that you're working with mostly right now? Uh, honestly, man, it's like, it's split between 11 to 13 year olds, then the high school population and then the college population. It's pretty even, honestly. Yeah. Yep. It, do you notice a big difference in like how receptive the different age groups are to these types of things? Cause it sounds like you do a lot of one-on-one -on -one work with a lot of these athletes as well. Um, yeah. Do you, do you notice that there's a big difference in with the ages and like how receptive somebody is to talk about something like legacy and purpose? Or are there sometimes kids that are just like, uh, this is way over my head and I just can't comprehend this right now? Yeah, I think there's always going to be like a, a certain threshold of like age that you get to. But I, even with a, an 11 year old, you know, talking about what's the legacy you want to leave this season versus mm -hmm. what's the legacy you want to leave at the end of your college career. It's all about yeah. timelines, right? Cause one yeah. year for an 11 year old is like over 10% of their life. Whereas two years for a 20 year old is 10% of their life. So I think it's all about, you know, legacy needs to be relative. Yeah. 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 That's a good point. Yeah. Um, you mentioned something right towards the beginning of this conversation about the, the role of the coach and like, it really resonated with something for me, which is like as a coach and as, as a parent as well is continuing to develop myself and how important that is. Cause like you said, 
a lot of times athletes are feeling external pressures. Like there's enough internal pressure that we put on ourselves to, to be successful and to achieve our goals and to, you know, be a winner and to really like live up to the expectations that we've set for ourselves. But there's also these external expectations that we put on as passionate parents and passionate coaches who, you know, a lot of coaches also have a brand that they're trying to maintain through their athletes, through their students and that type of thing. And then parents living vicariously through their kids as well. You know, there's that parent who's so passionate about their kid being the best hockey player. And so like this, this, uh, this pressure that's put on these kids, how important is it for uh, parents and for coaches to do their own self work in your opinion? So my friend uh, Trina, she blew me away when when we were talking about this very thing, because uh, she always struck me as a mom. She had kids who played high level sports. They were scholarship bound, you know, like all those things. Yet she never seemed to get too caught up in their sport and never seemed to get overly emotional when their kid would get injured and not be able to play the rest of the season or when her daughter didn't get the scholarship she wanted. She never seemed to get overly emotional about it. And I asked her why. I'm like, how is it that you are not so deeply connected to the outcomes that your kids are producing in their sport? She said, Andrew, I still have my own goals in life. She said, I'm 47 years old. And guess what? She said, right now I'm trying to hone my craft as a speaker and as a communicator. She said, I have a couple of goals for my own personal and physical fitness in the next couple of years that I want to achieve. And so, I mean, that's the key right there is do you have your own goals that you're working towards? Yeah. So powerful, right? Because yeah. a lot of people, I think, and I've gotten myself caught in this and had to check myself, but it's like your kids almost become your goals. Yeah. Right. It's like my goal Dangerous. is for my kid to be successful. Like my goal is for my kid to fulfill their fullest potential, like that kind of stuff. It's, it's really easy to not recognize what that's doing to the child. Yeah. Right. Or even to the adult, like even as like a coach that coaches adults, even I'm sure you've seen this even at the college level too, right? Where it's like you can easily get trapped in that. It's like your success is my success kind of mindset. It's it's dangerous, not just for you as the person who's now, you know, putting your success into somebody else. It's also very dangerous for that person who's now has this pressure of like, if I'm not successful, it's not just me who has to, you know, grieve them. It's now this other person, right? Yeah. I had a, I had a parent, uh, after grabbing the book for his child and then his team, uh, he texted me a picture of him reading the book with his 11 year old son, I think it was, and doing the exercises. And what he said to me was, he said, Andrew, he said, I didn't realize like I needed to sit down and do these exercises for myself to think Mm -hmm. about my own strengths and my own, my own uh, gifts, think about my legacy and my purpose. And what he was basically saying was, Hey, if I don't do these things for myself, I am going to be trying to live vicariously through my son and his sports. I know it. And that's going to happen. And so the reflection question for all of us listening is, what are my goals? Like take out a piece of pen and paper, write it down now. What's my legacy? What are my goals? And if it's hard for you to write it down, that means it's time to do the work. We got to yeah. do the work. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. And I don't think there's anything wrong with wanting things for your students for your kids like there's nothing there's nothing like I don't think parents should feel guilty about that of like I want to see my kid win first place or I want to see my kid get that scholarship but I think it comes down to are you leading by example like are you demonstrating that life that you want for your student or for your child or um because I think a lot of times it's it's almost resentful for the child to look and be like, Hey, I'm putting in all the work here. Like, I understand you want me to be successful, but like, what are you doing? (laughs) Right. Having that, that lead by example mentality of like, am I working towards stuff? Am I setting goals? Am I celebrating my accomplishments? Am I shifting my perspectives on different things? Right. Yep. Yep. So important. Awesome, man. Um, I want to be respectful of your time. Um, and there's so much more that I want to talk to you about, but can you, um, can you tell me a little bit more just real quick about the exercises that are throughout the book? Cause I know you've got these, uh, you said a seven key kind of hacks that, that people can go through and just like 
real strong core points that, that people can take away from the book, but there's also exercises you said involved as well, right? Yeah. Some of them I've mentioned already, right? Like reflection on your wins and your, your, where, what you've accomplished in your life. One of them is reverse engineering the story that you want to tell, right? When my, when my sports career is nothing more than a sport, a story that I tell, what story do I want to tell? Um, some of them are about success and your definition of success. Some of the exercises I'm trying to think now, uh, they do have to do with like self-worth and your identity and that I am type stuff. So questions are so powerful, man. And so I spent a lot of time in this book trying to craft the questions in a way that would naturally get a person to start flowing with, with the truth and with the way they actually thought and felt. Uh, Cause if you just ask like, what are your goals? Well, it's not always the best question to ask, right. Versus what matters most to me at this season of my life, given all, all that's going on right now, that's a different question. So yeah, there's exercises. I'm pretty sure there's probably like over 30 or 40 exercises throughout the book, writing exercises. You got to be ready to do the work though. Got to be able to do the work. Yeah. Yeah. It's like anything, right? It's great to, it's great to be committed to sitting down and reading it and getting more information, but you got to be willing to take that information, apply it. And like you said, put the work in. Yeah. And there's a, I mean, there's a, a science to it, right? It's like if, if people that I don't know the exact statistic, but people that write their answers down or write things down, retain up to 80% more than if you just read something alone because content's great, but we wonder why we read a book. And then like six months later, we're back doing the same things. We probably haven't written it down and taken action on it. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. All right. To wrap things up, I got three questions for you. Um, first one, what is your message specifically? Just if you had one message for athletes specifically, what would that message be for the athlete? Hmm. One message specifically depends on which one I'm talking to, man, but you are, <laughs> I, I think the, probably the primary one is that there is something that you've been put on this earth to do, to be great at that you will love doing and that you will help other people doing. And it is probably not your sport. It might flow from your sport, but just know that there is something. And so if you just stay diligent to searching for that and trying new things and experimenting with things, uh, eventually you're going to land on something that you really do love to do. You can be great at and, and you can uh, enjoy doing it. And so, yeah, I think that's probably the message for athletes. One of the most important ones, especially those high schoolers and college students. Yeah. Those is such a developmental time of life, right. And transitional time of life. Yeah, for sure. Um, okay. One message specific to the coaches that are listening right now. Hmm. However much power you think you have with your words and with your actions and with your reactions, multiply it by 10. And that's the actual power that you have. Mm. Everything you do speaks, everything you do impacts. I just had a conversation with a young lady who is a senior uh, who wants to go play sports in college. And because of the way that her coach was ignoring her, it literally had taken her into this tailspin of serious emotional mental health issues and all he needed to do was acknowledge her and pull her aside and talk to her one day for 10 minutes. And it literally turned everything right side up for her. And it's like, gosh, coach, like, I don't know how, and I'm sorry that like, maybe you didn't realize that you were signing up for that when you signed up as a coach, but it's just the truth. Mm -hmm. You've got so much power and it does feel like pressure sometimes, but I would say you've been called for a reason to be a coach and uh, lean into that calling. And the responsibility of it right? Like huge responsibility. Yep. Yeah. Awesome. That's powerful. And the last one, one message for the parents that are out there who are, you know, a lot of parents are coaching their kids as well. Like I coach my kids, but even parents who are coaching from the sidelines, but um, what's your one message for parents of kids who are athletic? Make it your aim. And there's a lot, man, this is, I knew you were going to ask me the parent question. Um, It'll be a full episode would, on its own, right? <laughs> yeah, right. Exactly. Um, I would say, well, first off, if you're coaching and parenting, always put your parent hat on first. That's what your mm. kid needs and wants. So parent hat comes first and the parent hat asks for permission to put the coach hat on. Um, but then I think the message really is uh, to make it your primary aim to lead your child towards their true self, their gifts, what they're great at, what they love to do. Make it your aim to lead them there, even if that isn't 
sports ultimately because only about three percent play college sports and 0.03003 play professional sports which tells me that there is something that your kid has been put on this earth to do that they can be again same thing i would tell the athletes that they can be great at that they will love doing that they'll make an impact doing it and it's probably not sports so let's yeah. really be focused on trying to help our kid discover that thing for themselves by being a student of your student yeah powerful stuff man where can people get the book? Uh, so you can get it on, you can get it on my website. So you go to andrewjsimpson.com and then through there, you can find all the resources. There's free mindset trainings for coaches, for parents, for athletes. Um, it's all on the website. Awesome. Am awesome. Amazon is ultimately a place too, right? Everything's on Amazon. Amazon has it too. <laughs> cool. Well, uh, everybody, if anything here resonated with you, which uh, if you're a parent, out there if you're a child out there or if you're a coach out there like for sure this resonated with you go grab the book make sure you check it out it's so powerful um and put the work in like don't just read it like live it put the work in go back to it reflect on it approach questions again right and like really take this seriously because it's um it is it's something that's just so so important as we continue to live in the society that we live in but also just try to develop a better world the sport and and just mental health are just such a huge part of that so appreciate what you're doing in the world and the impact that you're creating andrew it's it's really great to see so thanks for being here and sharing some of your stuff on the show thanks for letting me be another ninja for the day yeah <laughs> the athlete ninja andrew that's Simpson. right <laughs> Awesome. Well, thanks so much again. And thanks everybody for listening and watching. And we'll see you in the next episode. Wow, what a powerful episode today with Andrew. As an athlete, as a parent, and as a coach, just so many insights that are powerful to take away from how we approach sport and how we approach building a mindset that doesn't just set us up for success within sport, but in our daily lives as well as we progress. I want to thank you for joining this episode. Thank you in advance for engaging on this episode, liking, sharing, commenting. Take a screenshot, share it with us. Tell me what your favorite thing was about this episode. I love to hear that, and I really appreciate you sharing this with your communities so that we can spread the impact. If you'd like to reach out to me directly or need support on your own journey, you can find me at wellnessdojo.ca or on any of our social media platforms. Thanks for being here. See you in the next episode.